with the Danbury, Danbury Public School System. Okay, thank you. Um, is there anybody? Oh. Kevin, I'm saying <laughs> in case I didn't call you. Just in case, yes. Kevin um, had that. I'm a fourth grade teacher at King Street Intermediate School and brought along a few friends tonight who also teach with me and I'm also a Denver resident. And uh, two things I wanted to address. Uh, the first one would be SBAC. Um, I just wanted to make sure, that, and I'm sure the board has heard some of this, but I hear it from a lot of colleagues. The scheduling disruptions in the school are pretty large. You know, for between four and six weeks, our computers are tied up strictly for testing. That means there's no academic work taking place utilizing technology. Um, we've got the kids taking practice tests beforehand. You know, will that go away? You know, after they've done these tests year after year, maybe, but certainly not on the lower end third and fourth graders, if you've ever worked with them, they don't always remember from one day to the next, let alone one year to the next. Um, and quite frankly, you know, having looked at the practice questions that are out there, um, it's a really hard test on, on almost any level. Um, some of the things we're asking these kids to do on these tests are just not developmentally appropriate or similar to the experiences they have in the classroom. So what I would ask you all to do, because I know the you know, SBAC is not your idea, um, but keep an eye on legislation that's going through the legislature and continue to lobby with um, someone like CAVE to eliminate this testing and, and reduce it and, and let teachers teach. That's what we want to do in the classroom. We don't want to be test administrators, which is what we got nice and little certificates that say. Uh, the other thing, um, teacher evaluation, it's another thing that takes up way more time than it should. I know, um, you know some people wonder, you know, why does it take up so much time? Well, because we, it's a three-part process, the beginning of the year, mid-year, and then again at the end of the year, you get big computer screen full of boxes and you have to decide which are the boxes that apply to me that I have to fill in. And then am I putting the right information in the boxes? I think I'm putting the right information in. Let me check with my administrator. Your administrator checks and then if you've done it wrong, you've got to do it again. You've got to work with your team to change your goal. And it's a lot of work with little to no impact on the teaching that you do with your students because the classroom is still running the way it needs to. You've still got to assign homework and you've still got um, all of your teaching that, that takes place. But all so much of our time this year is tied up with um, SBAC training and teacher eval training on how to operate the system that, again, we're not getting those chunks of time to work with our grade level partners to focus on teaching. Um, so, you know, Keep lobbying for us, fighting for us, and if you've ever got questions, come to us and ask us. We'd be more than happy to help explain it to you. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks. Um, is there anyone else that would like to speak in the audience? I don't know if I don't know it's silly. Can I do that? Okay. Okay. That's it. Anybody? I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, we have to have a consent calendar. Um, that the Board of Education approves the items on the consent calendar exhibits 15-57 through 15-59 as recommended. Second. Seconded by Ralph. Okay. Any questions, comments? I have one comment before we vote. Mm -hmm. I would like to thank these people. I want you to listen to the years. Joan Bybee, 42 years. She's at Mill Ridge. She was there when my son was there. Some people are retired, as is the lady in the audience. Tony Fenton, 25 years. Susan Joy, 35 years. Teresa Capillaro, 31 years. Thank you, all of you. Thank you very much for your time. And thank you to all of you sitting in the audience also. OK, go ahead. All in favor? I can't.
any of the stations. Any, is there an employee representative that would like to speak? Okay. Student representatives. We have one right here. Hi, I'm Rachel Lowney, the BMG Vice President. So recently at Danbury High School, our DECA students competed in states and multiple teams placed and will be heading to nationals at the end of April. Our honors accounting students won first place at the Junior Achievement Competition at Fairfield University. Our RTC drill team placed second at the Newburgh Drill Meet. The boys indoor track team finished in ninth place in the country at the New Balance Indoor National Championship. And for upcoming events on March 30th at 6.30 in the auditorium will be our freshman forum. And tomorrow is opening night of the Wiz, so all are encouraged to come. And it's Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night. Thank the you very much. Do you want to talk a little bit about the freshman forum? You know what they're going to be. That is, that is put on by the, um, the social work group, and it's regarding, I think it's a student uh, suffers abuse. It's right here on there. So it's Monday, March 30th, in the auditorium. Educating students and parents about the negative consequences of underage drinking and drug use. It's in the students, which in turn 
general to uh, increase their earning potential. When we talk to our partners, New Oak, about giving students skills on informational technology, they talked about a starting job around $65,000, $70,000 a year. That's how much there's a need for this specific job. So that is something that intrigued us that we can set up our, our students to go through this program. And if they want to, they can turn around and be first in line for jobs. And it's not just new, but any information or technology job that's out there, and those are growing at about $65,000 a year. It's a bonus for the state of Connecticut, Fairfield County, and the city of Denver. We you know it's extremely expensive to live in this, in this county, and this is something that will keep the students and the people we have in our home city. Um, our mission statement, which starts on page two, is basically preparing students to excel in high school, college, career, and beyond. It, it kind of flows with what our high school is. It's just a little bit different because we're, we have to involve the higher education part to it. Um, the early college model, if we take a step back and look at it, it started in uh, Brooklyn in a school called P Tech. It's four years old there. They have the first graduating class going through. And in the state of Connecticut, there's currently one early college academy, and that's in Norwalk High School. And their partner is uh, Norwalk Community College and IBM are their partners. Um, they are, you know, they're called NECA. Uh, next year, there will be four more opening up in the state of Connecticut. I can never name all of them. I know it's in London. There's one on the Wyndham. Wyndham in Britain, maybe. One's manufacturing with electric boat. I know that. Um, so they're opening up as well as they go through. Um, we talk about what it is. It's a partnership between higher education and corporate and <coughs> Denver Public Schools. In our case, it's a Denver Public Schools, Naugatuck Valley Community College, and New Oak. Um, Naugatuck, as we know, services a lot of students coming out of Denver High School. They've just opened up uh, a new place downtown, so it's centrally located for our students, which is great. Uh, New Oak is a financial group that uh, express information technology needs, not financial uh, services. So they, they were part of this as well. And then also Pitney Bowes. Pitney Bowes is going to be involved in working with our mentors, mentees. Uh, New Oak is not large enough to provide us with, you know, by the time we're going, 500 uh, mentors. So Pitney Bowes is going to step in and be a larger company in Danbury and community service oriented. They're going to turn around and provide mentors for us. And we're flushing out right now what that looks like. Uh, IBM and Norwalk do use an online platform called MentorPlace, which they've decided they let us into for free. We're going to use that to start off and see where this develops from. Um, from those partners, including Danbury Public Schools, we developed a steering committee. Uh, and on that steering committee for Danbury High School, or Danbury Public Schools, is myself. Harry Ross Valley, Dr. Glass is on that, and Joe Martino are also on the standard committee, along with representatives from our other partners. Everyone is not equally represented, but it's just by their choice. They all have an equal weight in voting. It uh, has been going extremely well. We have meetings probably bi weekly with a whole bunch of different subcommittees that meet probably every week. Although we have been starting and talking about this project for nine months now. It started out with us in Augustuck and trying to work with the Health and Bioscience Academy at the high school. Mm -hmm. We could not find a corporate partner for that. And then we started out with Sedexo and Naugatuck, but the state really didn't want us to work on getting kids certificates. The state is, wants us to have students receive associate degrees. It is not a certificate-based program. They want associate degrees. So that's what we decided. We, New Oak had contacted the state, and the state knew we were looking for a partner, so it was a good match all around for everybody. The program also has a program director. Uh, we have a letter of understanding that is different than a memo of understanding, one of the things that I learned through this process. And it is going to be a part time person starting in year one and year two. We're hoping to receive between 80 and max out of 100 students that are going to go through the first cohort of this. Um, with that, we'll have a point four director in charge of this program. Uh, for year one, we understand the financial responsibility that the board has and could not hire a full-time, as they call it, assistant principal level position for 100 kids at this moment. So putting it in 0.4, 0.8, and 1.0 in three years 
by that time we'll have 500 to 600 students in the program. Uh, the director will see all facets of the program, just kind of like I do with the freshman academy. Although at assistant principal level, uh, there is some autonomy that the uh, this director will have to run their program as they choose to see fit. It will require some different uh, parts to it that don't fall under exactly like Danbury High School, including going off campus to take classes down in Bogotuck when they're in their possible fourth or fifth year. This is a program that students can finish in four years if they decide they want to give up time over the summer and load up their schedules. We foresee most students completing it in five, and there will be some students who will, may have to take six years to complete this program. Um, our goal is to get the majority of them done in five. I think another problem we're having right now talking to the public is getting them past the fact that their student will be around the high school for five years. So most are, you're out in four, you graduate, you move on, but now you're going to be there another year. You still may be on Danbury's high school campus, but you may not be down in another time. But the thing they have to remember is, by the time they end that fifth year, yes, they graduate again high school, and they have an associate degree. And there's two fields of associate computer programming and business analysis, which is, from my understanding of it, is taking the business world and the computer world and the consumer and putting them all together. And that's a major, major thing that businesses are looking for right now. The program requirements, it doesn't change anything for us. It's still 21 credits. We do know that coming down in 2020, uh, it'll go to 25 credits as it's proposed right now. So we are looking at that. And as we make our scope and sequence, we have that in mind. It's still 60 credits for Naugatuck Valley to earn the associates. It doesn't give anything away. We still have to earn all. We still have to finish all of our requirements for the state and for the Embry High School. So it doesn't change anything. So how do you figure out you're going to do that? Well, one of the things that we do is developing the scope and sequence with Naugatuck Valley. Um, the steering committee is in a whole bunch of subcommittees at this point where we meet with Naugatuck, Danbury Public Schools is meeting with Naugatuck Valley to say, okay, what courses do we teach that you'll accept for credit? It's dual enrollment. Uh, we know that AP courses are generally satisfying college credit and they receive credit for those. But there are other courses. For example, we're in discussions where if a student completes our Algebra 2 and the instructor is certified by Naugatuck Valley Community College, the student can receive their algebra college algebra, their basic college algebra credit um, for that. So we're looking at those dual enrollments to see how many of the credits we can get through um, while we're still in the high school and in the high school settings and jump on the um, As I said, the subcommittees, that is a subcommittee between New Oak and Arlington Valley Community College, where they are looking at more of the technical skills. Uh, this is exactly what New Oak wants their people to know when they come out of this program. Now, one of the things that New Oak has been fabulous about is they are not designing this program so that every student files right into New Oak. They understand that they can't employ 100 kids a year coming out. So they're making this program that they're trying to design it wrong. So when they come out, they're employable to anybody who has any IT needs whatsoever. They're going to teach them, as we've been explaining, that 80% they need to be no. And then when get hired by a certain company, they usually teach you the last 20% that's specific to their company and what their needs are. So they've been very good with that in designing what they want to do. Uh, and Naugatuck has, has been very respectful and receptive to how they're going to change their program. And then we've been working with them on that part. The last subcommittee is a subcommittee between Danbury Public Schools and New Oak, where we have to develop new courses one of which is called workplace learning, which everyone refers to as the soft skills, the speaking and listening skills, the team building skills. That's going to allow our students as sophomores, I mean, as juniors or seniors, step into a workplace or an internship if they choose and be productive. And we're not talking about internships where they go in and they're following somebody around and job shopping. We're talking internships where they're expected to go in and be productive in what they do. So we are developing a course called workplace learning in which students will practice these skills, whether it's team building or salesmanship or how to just shape someone's hand and look in the eye and enter a meeting. 
uh, things that high school kids get throughout four years of every high school, we have to condense it into less than the courses that we have to do. Also in here is a copy of the four-year scope and sequence that NOLA uses. Um, it didn't come out as well as I had hoped when I copied it, but the gray areas are the dual enrolling courses that the students get college credit for and also more high school credit. So if an intro to computer class and it's taught by one of our teachers, they get intro to computers at North South Valley, and they also get the computer credit for us to meet that requirement. That's an example. Um, mentorships, as I said before, are pretty much done by Pitt and Bowes. They're, they're charged to find it, and you won't, as our corporate, we corporate partner, their job is to turn around and find more internships if, if needed, uh, and more mentors if needed. That's their job as the corporate partner. But Pitney Bowes has stepped up, and we are in meetings with them, and while we're talking exactly what the mentor looks like, how much time they're gonna use, is it all virtual, is it face-to-face, -face? Uh, those have not been completely flushed out yet. And I also include the sample schedule of what a freshman year would look like. So a freshman year, the big change is that they would take two English. They would take English two periods a day, every day, for semester one to fulfill the time and pacing requirements for English one. And the second semester, they would take two periods of English every day to complete English two. As I said earlier, it's to get them through the writing skills that are needed to get become more employable that we need to make them to their internships. The first discussion we had with them was math. We had to accelerate math. Uh, and the corporate partner did not believe we needed to because computers, we don't need to get up to calculus as fast as they expect. They need this thing. Uh, they said they need to use And then they take the other ones, the math, biology uh, classes. We we're discussing how we're going to do the world studies if it's not this year, if it's sophomore year or if it's a blended learning environment, if it's coming after school, or things like that. And then they have their two electives, whether it's PE health or language band, things like that. And then they have their workplace learning class. So we're very mindful that if we excluded students that said, no, you have to be in this program and nothing else, you can't be in the band, you can't play the music, anything like that, we wouldn't get enough kids. So we're very mindful that school day, right now is going to end at 2 o'clock, and you can go play a sport if you want to or you can go in the band or something like that. Uh, there will be requirements that if a student falls below a certain average in the class, they may have to spend some time in that class after school. So those are some of the things that we have. Um, the other part of the component of it is a summer experience. For the incoming right now, just we'll just be ninth graders, we're looking at a five-day experience to do some uh, baseline assessments on them to meet their corporate partners and hopefully meet their mentors at that point. They'll get to know the team, we'll start working on those team building activities. We have the opportunity to go watch uh, the NECA kids meet with the IBM mentors in Southbury. It was a really great day to watch them interact. They had an engineering project where they had to build certain things out of just whatever they gave them a day. And to watch them to talk themselves through this problem and to see them work interactively with respect to each other was a great thing to see. Um, the summer experience, we've been on a little bit of a fundraising tear by going to the different banks in Danbury, same thing in Danbury, you would say, and requesting uh, funds from them to see if we could, they want to be part of this and back us. So, as it appears right now, it looks like uh, Savings Bank of Danbury is going to help us fund the summer experience. So we can go forward with this. Uh, we did have an application. It's online. It was done by CREC. Uh, we don't control it. They control it. It's done in English and Spanish. We also created a website uh, that's linked to the Denver High School website, and the applications are also linked to the Denver Public Schools website. Uh, with the brochure that you have that I was giving you that we made is also translated into Spanish and Portuguese that we have for them that we gave out the other night. And the other stuff is just our contact information. We did set up a Denver Echo email that we can go into if anybody has questions and gave phone numbers which are actually it's my phone number. Uh, while I'm not the director of this program, I'm acting like the director uh, in the absence of one and help setting this up. I've had a lot of help from uh, Dr. Sal, Dr. Glass, Joe, and Harry Ross Valley and Matt Skowski in putting this together. Uh, and so, you know, I'm so 
but that's kind of the information. It's a lot to take in. I'm sorry I rushed through it. Is our associate degree the same as our other associate's degree? Is our associate degree the same as it? Yeah, it's an associate degree. It's a full blown associate's degree. 60 credits. 60 credits. Yeah. And security for the mentors. And security for the mentors. Yeah, that's why we're discussing it. Um, the question was about our mentors' security and stuff like that. They'll be vetted out just like our mentors for DSABC. Um, we are actually a little bit. Yeah, it will be the same exactly. We're discussing whether what components, right now it looks like the face, the face components of it will be chaperoned in like what we saw the other day. Everyone seems to be comfortable with that. Uh, it's going to be, we'll put this on at some meetings before you know, the school year. It's one in the middle of the school year. It's at the end of the school year to watch how it goes. So, um, there, right now, the, the plan is that this is, there is no cost for these students. And we are trying very hard, and this is above me, to secure our legislation that pays for this. I know that they were putting it through this year, and then retracted it, and then the budget season kind of came around and said, oh boy, I'm not sure we get this through. So I'm not just out of the line of class and speak to you on that, but, but going forward, it doesn't affect us for two years, is that there will be funding for this and no cost to our students. Okay. Any questions? Okay, I just don't. Okay, um, um, I only had one. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to know cost. Um, you know, it's not too long to really obtain. Uh, uh, the question is, they have to make they have to make up their minds right at coming into the ninth grade to get into this program. Yes, they and cannot they, join uh, after this. I, I just, you know, yeah. I don't know if there's any possibility of being more flexible. I'm just thinking of the maturity of ninth, you know. Ninth grade students and the, and the way you know, you know, people change their majors, even coming out of, you know, after four years of high school, sometimes they help make three or four changes when they go to a normal college program. So I just was wanting to just throw that out to give thought to the group. I, I love the concept of, of uh, doing this because I think it will make things, uh, college education available to students who might not have it. Which is the, the number one goal for this. As for changing your majors, it is based in technology at this point, but by no means does it mean a student that wants to go to college has to come out with an associate degree and go to work. You know, we met with the students out of Brooklyn, and out of the four that we talked to, three of them were going on to pursue. One of them was, had nothing to do with technology, he was going to go to the marketing degree. But he turned around and said the associate's degree, number one, helps him afford college. And two, gave him a background in technology that most people in the marketing degree won't have. So it was very best. And they got rid of all their work. Okay, Ann Rose, I have two questions. The first one, um, the other program that's been ex in existence for four years, the first class is graduated. Um, do they have any students who started the program and then maybe in 10th grade opted out or just said this is really not what I was thinking it was or didn't want? In New York City, you can only transfer out of uh, your high school after your freshman year. And they said that it's, you know, it's different down there. You have to, this group that came in was actually, in New York City, you can choose the high school you want to. You go to apply, you list a whole bunch of what you want to go to. These, this school opened up very late in the process, so a lot of these students didn't want to go to the school. They were kind of last choice, and now that they're there, they see the numbers they gave us were they started with 102, they went down to I want to believe 93 after that year, and out of that 93, almost six of them are graduating in four years, the other 86 are on track to graduate in five. Most of them stay. Most of them stay. My last question I think the application process is open. And what Can I get a number? Sure. Do you, do you have, I was just it's, last share? time I checked, it was around 15. Right. Now it was four or five years ago. We do have a, if we don't watch that number go up significantly, we do have a plan in place to go recruit. Uh, we, when we went and registered our ninth graders down at Broadview, Rogers Park, uh, and West Side, as well as the Protocol Privates that came in, there was a checkbox on 
the registration method. So I'm interested in the net rate echo program. So our goal right now is to go and contact each and every one of those students and say, hey, this is open, it's still here. If you have questions, come in and meet with me and we can discuss it. I think a lot of people are just nervous about it's a completely different program. It's nothing that's happened around here in Connecticut. It's only one of the schools that's doing it. They're showing some great success in it. And it's just people are backing off because they're not sure about it. Yeah. yeah, I was at the presentation that you guys did. My son is going into high school, and I said to him, the first, you mentioned it, I said, yeah, you know, it's program probably five years. I'm not going to high school for five years. <laughs> yeah, he's in no way. But um, it was a good presentation. I think there was a lot of information, and I, I didn't really see the turnout that I thought I would see. I mean, would you say we about 50 people? A little bit more, but yeah. I mean, but there were some good questions. It was a, it was a good presentation. A um, couple questions. Um, so after four years, you graduate. I mean, you walk. You walk. You say graduate the high school. You walk the field for four years, or you wait till you're fifth and walk the both. That hasn't been determined yet. If you want to walk after four years, you can walk after four. If you met the high school requirements, you technically graduated from Denver High School. But I'm saying, but will will they meet the requirements in those four years to graduate from high school? school? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so they'll, they'll meet those in probably three. Okay. Three so in average, average student, you think is going to do it in five? Five. Now, if our preference would be that if they're not in line to, with the dual or graduate, like the four students in Brooklyn, that after four years they would graduate. And then I have an agreement with um, the president of Naugatuck, the youngsters can take courses on the college campus. When we started this whole thing, was our idea was to have students exposed to the college campus earlier than their, you know, post-secondary years. So we want to work this in, in here. Also, we have a space problem. That's not so, you know, uh, our conversation has been around, grant, those are the kids that have met dual, they're both gone. They get a dual degree. And those that need a fifth year, the intent is to graduate them, they can take courses. But they're still part of the DECA program, yeah. only on that campus. They will, that fifth year, they're not going to be taking English or anything. They're going to finish up the college credits the college that credits. They, they didn't get done. In. Here, we marketing this. Teenagers here in five years in high school, that's not happening. So yeah, that's, that. yeah, we need to agree. get that marketing thing off the table. No, no, yeah, no. Thank I mean, you. in, in the, present, the presentation, yeah. that's how it, you know, even now, it, you know, you explained it a lot better here as far as the five, the fifth year, which, which I like. So now I can, you know, go back and, you know, if he wants to do it, you know, I mean, if I want to do it, I'll do it. But, you know, I've explained it, I can sell it a little, a little better. Also, um, now, how, new old, um, how many uh, kids have they commit, committed to? to give a job after the five, the five years? They haven't. They have, you haven't talked about No, them. but their job not only is to, you know, take, put kids first in line, their job is to find corporate partners oh. and say, hey, listen, I'm sending you a quality candidate. And if I had a job, I would hire right. this, this person who come in, and maybe not all of them will, you know, in, in the five years when they're out of here. Some companies are going to have a tough time wrapping their head around hiring a 19-year-old to do an IT job. But that's New Oak's job is to, they can't hire that many. They're not that big. Well, at least up here. They are. Right. They're in Manhattan still and they're in other places. But their job is to find those companies that say, listen, I'm, I'm giving you someone pretty good right now. Uh, you know, you've got to train them just a little to get them where you want them. But I'm, this person's solid. And that's what they're going on. So how, how versatile is the, um, like, you know, it's, a, it's an IT associates. I mean, five years is a long time from now. Who knows what's going to be more than five years. I mean, is there any, any wiggle room in there to like you think possibly convert to maybe something a little different? Um, you know, when you get to that kind of fifth year and there's some classes they might be able to take instead of something else, or it's too far out to really? It's, I mean, they're talking right now what courses they need for the associate degree. And in those courses, it, you know, when you look at the college thing, it's pick three out of these seven. Right. So it's not going to be you have to take this, this, and this. You can pick. Java, if you want to do Java, if you want to pick a different do a program, you want to pick that. But it's going to be uh, you know, pick three of these five that you have to accomplish to get to fulfill this requirement on database systems, and that's what they're working on right now. They, uh, Noah Talk, has been very committed to being open to looking at their courses regularly because uh, Brian, who is New York's technical IT director says that this is constantly changing. No. In, in a year, it's going to be completely different. So they are well aware of the fact that the, what the students are going to be learning in their third year 
may be different three years down the road. So they're going to try to keep up as best they can. Nugatuck sponsored a uh, program three weeks ago. I was invited to the whole back back room technology of the forensic research into fraud is blown across all the industries. They can't find folks that can go through and uh, know programming well enough so they could see, I mean, all of the nuances that put the red flags up to start investigating. So their point that when we talked about it was to try to look for a strand in the DECO program that would align with that, not just ours, but the other ones. Mm -hmm. The whole idea was Governor Malloy saying, we've got 50,000 jobs open and we don't have qualified people and we shouldn't let that happen. So let's get folks in this industry. So that's why it's, they wouldn't permit us to go into culinary and the rest to go here. But within, within, that, within that compendium of courses, they are looking at uh, other ones. One of these they're looking at is forensic review, which creates different programming courses mm -hmm. instead of the calculus courses. So they're already looking at that as they develop. Of course, it's ever changing. Yeah, definitely. It's ever changing. It's a great opportunity. It'd be a shame if we couldn't get at least our 80 students to move forward. If we don't get our 80 students, we're going to be challenged. And, and, and just hearing from other parents who I've spoken to, since I also have a, a son going into um, high school next year. What I'm hearing is just the uncertainty of their child. They don't, their kids don't know if they even want to be involved in something like this. It's, and to the parent, it sounds wonderful. Um, but most of these kids, the one thing that we just love about Danbury is that you can explore many different options. And they don't have to already decide by ninth grade what they want to be in life. And so what I'm hearing more is you know, it sounds great. Wow, what an amazing opportunity. But, but I don't know if that's where my child is going. And and also, um, the other comments that I was hearing was, what did, in the end, I know it gives you associates for um, information technology, but what does that really mean? Like, what, it does it mean, it's, you know, is that the kind of um, way you would want to go if your child's looking into, you know, engineering or, so they, there was a lot of questions about that. Like, what could they do with that? Like, what does that mean? What other titles or what jobs exactly? Is it just a broad umbrella IT position? Or what other places could they go? So that's what every, I mean. Every company that is out there has IT needs. Every company. From, you know, any job that you can think of, even our own district has a number of probably not as many as we would like. Um, but it's every job they have. So if someone wants to be an engineer, they can go through this program, grab the associate's degree in IT, and if they want to keep going on and be an engineer, guess what? They're not applying to college. They're transferring. And all of those credits that they've taken get to go to Westcon, Southern, uh, Central, they transfer right in. So now they have 60 credits in a four-year school. I think really that needs to be your focus in marketing this. Honestly, um, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but you know, based on the people that went to the uh, presentation and what I'm hearing, I'm not, I'm not, I don't think they're clear on that. So I think that would be the more important piece that I would So maybe we need a career path. Yeah, I'll go back to the steering committee and we'll figure out how we're gonna be helpful. Get it out there that you know we wanted to stay away from certain words like free. Uh, you know there is no cost at this point, but if we don't get legislative help, the Rolling Top can't pick up the tab, and neither can every public schools. So we try to stay away from that. We're going to uh, we want to people to know that it's part of the program, but we don't want people to think everyone has to graduate in four years. We thought that would scare people because there's it's a caseload to get out in four years. We thought wrapping our head around the five-year part, then people understand it's okay. We'll be out of Danbury High School, but we'll be out in Naugatuck taking the classes was the most important thing that we could try to say. And we'll go back and really look at it. I think creating that career pathway with the options in there would be, would be helpful. Yeah, there's no question it's based on the European model. We're mm -hmm. focusing early instead of widening it, so it is. And you know, we've all educationally have gotten that pressure. You know, if you look at the post-secondary, post-college work now, 
where people are getting masters, 30% of the graduates are getting masters, and about 10% are getting a certificate. What we read was it's inverse now. People are leaving college, their, their degrees are so um, organic that the companies are saying, I got to retrain, so they're giving them a certificate. So instead of getting an MBA, they're getting, they're getting something else. So you, and that's why it's filtering down to get, have our kids focused. And are we willing to make that commitment? Because it's school, we didn't focus that way. So I think the parents may think it's a good idea, but they'll, they'll, they'll really wonder, can their kids do it? They're doing it in Norwalk, they're doing it in New York, they're doing it out west. Yes, they can do it. If we could get the right verbiage out there, what we're doing, I think that's helpful for us. Sure. Uh, so, that's good. so we'll see. We'll keep everybody informed. All they have to be interested to get into it. That's it. I thought, as Bob did, is there an opportunity to open up 10th graders? You know, I know they'll say no. They're very prescriptive with us, just so you know. Early on, it's very prescriptive. They're very prescriptive, even with what you have to push the courses forward a little bit more. But I college courses. After this first year, after the first year, it'll be fine. Because then people will know what it is. It's just looking at what their freshman year looks like. It's not a big difference in your average freshman year. It's not. It's just a little bit. One more question. That's it. I should say comment. Um, in Norwalk, I know that when you've gone to the middle schools, um, I know that I hear from my my son that's, that makes an impact on him. And I'm just wondering if having some of the kids in the program team and speak to our middle school um, eighth graders, just so that they can ask them questions like, well, you know, did you have more courses? Did you have to do like? Okay, so more homework. Like I, that's where they are right now. That's their level. Um, it could help. Well, they go into a meeting. Maybe that's because that's sure. not a bad idea. Sure. Okay. Good idea. And these will, you know, these kids will ask other kids, and other kids will tell them the truth about really how this it worked for them. Anybody else that has any other ideas? Just what? When's the application deadline? The application deadline right now is April 10th, right before spring break. Right? And when did it all think that? March 6th. So, so let's push back. Any other ideas for that? For, for Mr. Donovan, you can just call him and supply us with his telephone number. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, Mr. Donovan. Thank you, Dan. Nice job. Okay. Um, action items. Ready? So, that the Board of Education delete policy 9-111.1 entitled directory employees and students to be incorporated in revised 7-125 policy in accordance with 15 61 Sarah second. Second. Gladys? Did you second? Okay. Seconded by Gladys Cooper. Any discussion? Questions? Seeing none. I'll try your minds. All in favor? Aye. 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 Abstentions? Okay, thank you. Moving on. That the Board of Education replace policy 7 125 and regulations entitled student records with the revised student records policy 7 125 in accordance with 15 62. Seconded by Mr. Tabersat. Any questions or discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Abstentions? No's? Okay, thank you. That the Board of Education accept the February 2015 operating results analysis of the general fund in accordance with 15-63. Second. Seconded by Mr. Ferguson. Any discussion or questions? Mr. Hollett. Joe, if I could ask, object code 201, health insurance. We're ahead of the game? We're okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> No, actually, we're monitoring claims closely, actually, as of this morning. We did have some interesting activity in our, uh, some of our drug claims. Um, there is a lot of, I'll call them designer drugs out there for treating a lot of um, different conditions that exist for cancers, and we do have some increased usage in those, which is good. People are getting better, but I was concerned to the cost. But right now, we're, we're on projection on that. We're monitoring, as I said, we did have a kind of slowly coming down off that. Yeah, so far so good, we look okay. But claims are different as we move into the um, April or May. Any other questions? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. 
extensions the decap. Did the Board of Education accept the February 2015 operating results analysis of grants and projects in accordance with 15 64? Seconded. Okay. Um, Mr. Ferguson. Any questions? Discussion? Seeing none, um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Just to mention, there was a forum in um, in town sponsored by the NAACP, uh, the Color of Justice. We had uh, Gary and myself, actually Police Chief uh, Baker was there. We probably, I don't know if any board members were there. Right? Okay, I don't think so. It was up at the uh, the church um, on the uh, way to high school on the left hand side. We, we we talked about institutional racism, and they reviewed the data across the state with suspensions, expulsions, um, and, and we talked about, you know, we had a whole thing in Ferguson and all that going on in terms of uh, sensitivity towards uh, uh, different cultures. And um, I thought the presentation was really balanced. It was, in fact, we want to watch it on TV. And it's a, a video that was made for TV where it, it talked about the racism and talked about different races coming together dealing with institutional rules and regs um, for, for, for fairness towards and equity for students. So we're going to show it with our administrators. We walked away that night with um, a commitment to uh, have a subcommittee and keep looking at it. They looked at the data here in Danbury particularly, and uh, you know, we were quite happy with it. Uh, the, the groups there were quite happy. There is an acknowledgement there that um, in Danbury there seems to be a no, I hate to use the word tolerance. I really hate to use that word. So, but the, the mixing of, uh, I call it the kaleidoscope effect. You know, people work together very nicely, and um, that's very appreciated by all of the constituents that were there. There was no hammering of the police department or of the school system, but it was one of working together for the good of the community. So I thought it was very positive. Um, and uh, I'll keep you informed uh, on if any other things that are going on. Yeah, it was very, it was worthwhile. We have a discussion. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about the ECS information. Sure. Thanks, Jeff. Go, Jeff. From time to time, you hear us talk about ECS, excess cost, and the terms we go through, and I kind of wanted to break it down as, as best we could on what's inside when we say things like excess cost or ECS. Um, so, first page, it kind of breaks down what the special education excess cost grant is. Excess cost is reimbursable to a school district. What the grant does, it covers four and a half times, um, the district response are four and a half times of net per pupil expenditures for each special education child. That is calculated by the state of Connecticut. Um, we submit our financial reports at the end of the year. Um, if a child is placed in a state agency, like for example, DCF places a student in our district that has what's known as a a no next, it doesn't have a sending town, we get 100% reimbursement back for those children. We do have uh, a significant number that, as of this year's budget that have come from DCF. Um, and all costs are reimbursable um, by the, from the state of Connecticut. The second page kind of breaks down the way the calculation actually works. Um, when you take the four and a half times Danvers' net per pupil expenditures is $12,683. So four and a half times this amount would be $57,000 would be in a sense our, our portion responsible for paying for an outplaced student. So if we had a student for $110,000 outplacement, which would be transportation plus tuition, which is not uncommon in, in a special ed outplacement situation, Danvers should receive back $52,000 for that child. The problem is the state of Connecticut, you know, for probably the past five or six, six, seven years that I can remember, the excess cost grant has been capped. So let's say, for example, there's $100 million inside that grant. 
all the districts in the state are buying against that, that $100, $100 million. And special education costs go up every year, transportation costs go up every year, the number of places children on some years go up significantly, and this year being one for January. Um, so those funds get reduced. This year, for example, most years, it's 70 cents in the dollar. So the 52,000 are probably about $35,000, $40,000 reimbursement back to Danbury. So this is when we talk about, you know, unfunded mandates, those type of things that are happening at the capital. The, the uh, special education grants, for example, and the state hasn't really, you know, come through fully on its promise. It's a, the calculation works right, the grant works like it should, there's just not enough funding in the grant to actually make it work. Um, and as I said, the second page, the, the next page, the excess cost grant is capital. It's about 70% every year um, for those expenditures. Just by the way, when he says go to Danbury, he means to the town. Yeah. Yeah. Just so you all get it. That, mo that money comes back to the city, which is then part of your total appropriation for next year's budget is how your excess cost funds. So I don't understand that. Say that again. What happens is inside, so if your budget's $100 million, inside that $100 million encapsulates some of your excess cost of grant. The city gives it as part of your overall allocation. Where it gets complicated is when you have years like we're going through right now, and you see that special education budget's over half a million dollars, over budget, mm -hmm. our budget. The, depending on the calculation of the grant, Danbury's excess cost funds will go up because obviously there are more outplay students, there will be more money coming back in the excess cost grant. Um, when the grant goes back to the city, though, we're trying to make up, we're trying to close the budget hole this year. So that's where we have discussions with the town of the city, and this may be a year we may have to do that, or because it's some of the outplacement tuition numbers, we may have to talk about that excess cost. Um, and that's a, you know, it's an ongoing, it's a concern you can't control. I mean, it's fine. We do, I mean, actually, to Debbie Peterson knows as well, our special outplacements are actually fairly low for the districts outside, so it's, um, it's not even responsible. Approximately how many outplaced? I would say 40 between 48 and 50. However, about 23 of those are through our own. We have about 13 this year alone to DCFS, so, but I thought there was about 20 of those from DCF that we have no control over of, of the numbers that she's giving. So there's two types of way going through our system, identifying the student. And us agree and say, yes, we have to have an out. Someone's coming in, a child's placed outside. We have no say in that PPT at all in, in our own programming. We're forced into those settings. So of the numbers that she's giving you, it, there, there's two sets. Our kids, in essence, and those placed by DCF. So there's some differences. And you have 1,300 identified students in the district. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's how it works. Um, and so out -placed, um, you said the number seems to have gone up in the years past? No, this, this, this year we've, we've gone up. We've gone up. So I guess my question is, are we up because we have reduced something in the district that did not cover, like in the past we had covered maybe a 611 class, or a, but now we don't? Thanks for coming, Millard. King Street, King Street. I'm so sorry. No, is it because we cut something? No. Could, okay. I mean, our numbers have increased. Okay. And um, when when Joe says that our outplacements have increased, I mean, he's really talking about anywhere from three to five outplacements. But okay. those outplacements are very expensive. Yes. So that right there could be half a million. But it's not because we heard, we have cut a program that no. we could have offered them here, but now. It's, it's not because of that. In fact, I think it's good timing. We are actually instituting a program next year to hedge out that, that kind of placement. Okay. Uh, so we're, 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 we'll be doing that, hiring a teacher. But it takes a year to have a program to, to have folks that are out of the district to come back. They have to have a program and visit. But we'll have some of our own students in the next year with the hope to bring some back. Mm -hmm. So that we have those going as well. But out of the numbers that Joe will talk about, some we don't have control of. But I just want to make the point that reimbursement does not come to Denver schools categorically. It comes to the cities. I mean, maybe maybe the wrong time for the question. So, an outpatient, on average, an outpatient is a, out. Excuse me. Yeah, outplacement is about one hundred ten thousand. 
on average? You could have some of the 50s, I mean, 50 right. plus plus. So for, versus so. what, what about in-house, to, 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 to Dr. Sales' point, as far as kind of, again, instituting those programs so they come here and stay here in Danbury, what would be the average cost there? A teacher and an aide. Teacher, teacher and an aide. So uh, that's what, exactly what we're doing. So it's one tuition, <laughs> tuition and a half. Okay. It's fiscally responsible and better for our kids to stay with their own kids. Right. But, but that's what we've been doing. We have those programs. The middle school next year, that's where we're putting one over right. at Rogers Park. We have space. Some of these programs need their own entranceways. These are not just come in the front door. Right. Correct. Oh, sure. Good. So we have the facilities. Mm -hmm. We'll have that for the exact reason that you're thinking. Right. Yeah. And we're able to serve multiple kids in those settings. So I mean, it's it's the, we we have really good in, in district programs. I have to say, well, kind of great really plan. Great I mean, they they really go a long way. And, and just I guess if I could have, so as total numbers, has that the thirteen hundred is all students as far as all special all children all within our district and. and and how is that? How is that number versus previous years? Where exactly. where does that stand in terms of say you know percentage? I mean we're we're clearly well over ten. You know, well, based the national on average is about eleven and a half, twelve percent. Okay, but we are up. I think uh, there's a lot of uh, nuances that are going on. Um, you heard some today, pressure and anxiety and uh, curriculum and uh, where you can get help for your kids. Right. I mean, there's a process we're going through along with our SRBI where. It's a mainstream program. The kids are being referred, but the overall numbers are up a little bit, but not that much. They're up, uh, yeah, they're up a little bit. And uh, like Sal said, um, DCF plays a, a large role in our, our numbers and the fluctuation of that. I mean, we, we get new students every week coming and going, coming and going through DCF. You know, one-on-one -on -one tutor is an example. Cost, even with if you outplace that child, you're 60,000, 70,000. So, I mean, we're still part of It's not because we're underservicing the children if they're getting what they should for their education, but, you know, it's, it's, it's economical for us. Our tutoring is up to about $3.5 million. That is. Uh, these, uh, versus putting the kids out, you can get, you know, that's, we were about $2 million about three years ago. You don't have these programs in-house, then what happens, you wind up placing them. I mean, so... It's, 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 it's not hard, it? Yeah, the uh, DCS students when they, uh, that we have no control is because they, they come and we have no control with the DCS play students because they already have DVDs already given to them or? Well, um, I mean, most I, of them are already identified. So, when so you have to go with the plan they have, yes. is my understanding. So yes. really there's not much leeway. So. No, and DCF um, this year they have a lot of new initiatives also and um, some new people um, in power. And so they are requesting a lot more evaluations for students that they're policing as well. And, and that's every, but that's not just Dan Barry. No, it's not. No, Burfield's seen significant outplacement and movement outplacements for that. Do you know another one? Do you want to say something? No. The next page is actually right from the state of Connecticut's website. They do the calculations show what the, basically when I said that term, capped and uncapped. Um, the items you see listed here are actually, if public transportation and non-public, for example, were uncapped, Danbury would receive, as you see to the right, the basically about another $1.2 million. Um, special ed. If you go to the bottom, we see grant type one, grant type two. That is your um, excess cost. So Dan Burton said because the excess cost grant is capped, there was $134,000 we did not receive from the state in excess cost. Most significant, obviously, is on the top line with uh, transportation. But again, the transportation grant was capped. Um, I think about 05, they, they, they capped that grant. So that's, that's an example we lost in that given year. Now, obviously, next year's numbers are probably higher with additional offers. And when you said that, when you explained it, I, I asked for this report just so everybody knows because I've been listening about ECS for a hundred years and. Um, Can't hear you. Not so I'll speak up. Is that better? I Thank you very much. I just understand. said I had asked Joe to do this report because I've been listening about ECS for a hundred years and and I understand it, but I don't understand it, and and I can be the only one of the eleven of us that that feels that way. 
and you all talk in edgy speak, is that what it's called? Yeah, I tried to non edgy speak this, but it was kind of hard to not. To. It's really hard. Yeah, yeah. there was really no good way to. So, anybody that doesn't understand my new policy is, is if you don't understand what the word is or what they're saying, just say, I don't understand that. Because they, they don't even realize they're doing God bless that. <clears throat> okay. Um, so, if you have questions, just ask them. Uh, because I found out what this is all about. So, continue. The, the next, the, so that the next page is the EC, the actual ECS formula, which is very complicated. I, I, this isn't really from the state's website. This is really just for reference only. I'm not going to go into it in great detail. Um, what you need to know about ECS, the grant has a wonderful calculation that goes with it. It calculates poverty, need, wealth of the communities. The problem with the ECS formula is back at 08, the state froze the formula in place. So Danbury's net. Base ECS in the city is $20 million using OH's formula. They never allow the formula to recalculate. So, what that means is, as you know, Danbury's population has gotten poorer and more needy. We've gotten no credit for those, any of that poverty and in, in the our increased ELL numbers because the formula is not allowed to actually work. Um, because there's also other districts that become, their demographics have changing, they've gotten wealthier, or they've had different shifts in their population. Um, so that's that's really what, what it talks about in the grant. And in um, the next page, the actual form, which again, I really just put the center for reference only. It's, um, it's, 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 it's a complicated equation the state does every year. Um, it, the, the one that I'll point, point out is where it says the foundation. That in a sense, what each child is worth in, in the state of Connecticut is $9,600. That's what the baseline for the form that one is actually set. Um, and you, you're supposed to. So it costs us more this page. It does. Um, next page is, is the information in the form. The form was changed in 07. And really, the way the form has changed, the benefit of Denver. Um, you had an increase in poverty and, and ELL students. You also moved up the measure on students in poverty and the waiting. But again, in, that, in those years, they've, they've capped out the grant. So there's been, we've gotten no no adjustments through the grant through the years. And the way it seems this year, the grant will probably be flat funded the way it exists today. Um, so there's not, not a lot of change in ECS. As you know, the ECS grant now is split because we have our alliance funding. So that, in a sense, was the governor's way to give additional funding to the urban school districts through the ECS funding. So there's two grants that come to the end. One is 20, $24 million, which is a, which is a true ECS to the city, and the 6.6 million comes straight to the board of that. So there's, there's two sections of that grant. The 24, 24 million that comes to the city is part of your budget allocation. So think of, again, that $100 million. The city is actually putting up net the 20 to 24 million. Mm -hmm. So that's 76, $76 million is what the actual city taxpayers pay. The other portion of the state of Connecticut is making. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, if, so I'm just going to ask if you could. If you could just tell us, and at risk of just speaking frankly, uh, if you could just tell us what the idea would be, what, what, how should it be changed? Like, well, the, 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 very, the, the very last page is the breakdown of ECS in the sense of towns that are what's called below 50%. There is a bill at the state of Connecticut right now. I'll be testifying next week. Dr. Sally so testifying. That lists towns that are below the 50th percentile on the target. And as you'll see here, going down the list, Danbury right now, we're funded 46% of our total ECS allocation. Our ECS, if it was funded, fully funded, is about $50 million. The goal of the legislation that's, that's happening up at the state right now is to get all the towns you see listed here to the 50th percentile. That 4% that represents about $3 million to Danbury in this, in this year. So it's, it's, it's significant, and you even to get to the 50th percent. Yeah. So if they had not capped it, would we have gotten that more? More. More. We would have gotten more. Yeah, yeah, if, if, Jeff, but they did. For example, they, what he's talking about would be under the formula that was capped and never really funded. But if you remember mm -hmm. CJF, if yes. we did the feedback of the 12 years, we were like $60 million in the rear. That we would have collected. You know, they've ranged from 41% of the 50% funding 
to the highest right now, they've never gotten up to 50%. Mm -hmm. So we're, uh, they haven't calculated. They've never, as they went to this meeting on Saturday, they just never put the money in the pot to, to fund it. This, if they just played out what we did from 07, we're sure. And if you look on the same graph you see here, it was from 2000 to 2013, free or reduced lunch meals percentage increases. The Amber's up 81%. You put that in there. So. Plus the ELR, which is not weighted. It's weighted, but as Joe said, not doesn't do anything. They froze it. Even though our ELL population is going up because the, the, they, they froze the calculation, there's no additional resources coming to us. So they patted themselves on the back for giving us, you know, for redoing it and then took it away with the other hand by having it. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's all. And the reason they're changing it from, from the legislators that I've spoken to is it's just too hard and too uncomfortable. So they just keep moving on to the next year without doing it. It, it is because you have to. One has to lose and one has to gain is the problem up there. And there was a, a, a town like, uh, just using a new town like might decrease the ECS, the damage to go up. And that's, that's the real problem. To me, the simple fight in Hartford is the excess cost. Because the excess cost calculation works. Everyone's special ed costs go up every year. And if there was one to fully fund, it was possible. That calculation works today. I mean, that, that's, that's functions the way it's supposed to. It's just, again, it's capped out. And, and, Frankly, your magnet school grants now are capping out. The state is capping many of the grants. So if we added another grade onto our magnet school, for example, we don't get any additional credit for those students. So, so of the approximate 70% that we do get reimbursed, which goes to the city, yeah. is the city in turn giving that to the board? Not in the year of occurrence. Not in the current. fairest way to say it. So, but, but they're, but they're within, within, within their state, do, do they get it after the fact? They, yeah. they, it's a, it's a, it's an income to the to the city, right? To to help mitigate the twenty four to the hundred twenty million dollars. So they look at, for example, I think they're in line for seven fifty or eight fifty, right? Yeah. For for reimbursement, right? Okay. Then when they get that money, they cobble it to to get to that hundred and twenty million that they appropriate for us the following year. Some places get it in time money, and that's what I'm arguing for. We are a half a million in the hole. That means there are things we could not do because of unexpected expenditures, but we can't realize that money because it doesn't come directly to us. Okay. It goes directly in two payments, one in December. No, February. No, Feb February and June. And then they recalculate again sometime in June, and that money goes into uh, categorically into the city. And then that money then is put into the appropriation, as that's what Joe was alluding to, for the following year. But during the during the impact year, we're out that money. What we've gotten from last year, so. No, I didn't say that. Well, no, you said that it seems as though that we're a year behind, or the reimbursement is basically a year behind, but incorporated into the funds so, that we so, receive. So, so for example, if I were to say that in my excess cost in, in tuition, I would put in all of the money that I would I know I need to pay for the students, and then the city would then categorically give me that money, the answer to that would be yes. Right. But if I'm asking for 4.9 million, 4.9 percent increase, and I get two percent increase, I'd never realized that money excess right, cost. Right. Right. But. In a traditional budget year, like let's use last year, we were about maybe 50 or 100,000 over on our special ed tuition. So as we had fully budgeted that number, the numbers came in where they were. But like in this year, so even though the city got the excess cost that year, it wasn't a case where the board ran the deficit on, on special ed tuition. Right, it, wasn't to, it wasn't to the, yeah, the, the $500,000 500, deficit. It doesn't come in, into play. Where this year comes more into play because we've had significant increases in, in those. And again, I say significant to Debbie's point. That's about maybe, let's say, six kids, seven kids, and just as an example. Yeah. So what? So should we or could we prepare a letter to the, to the legislators to say, hey, listen, you know, we've that's got what, that's what this is all about, right? We yeah. got. I mean, we've got, we've got to do something. And and is it on the, the new commissioner's agenda as well, far as to, well, to, to actually, review what he can? No, the law exists that the money is to be returned to the school district. But the money's capped, and that's 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 the issue. Is the fact that it's capped. That, that, yeah, you, we can that we can advocate for 100. percent Right. 
we could do that. I'm more, I'm more inclined to getting the money at the 70%, even though I got half of it, in, the, in, in kind during the year of the experience, it would mitigate these kinds of ex unusual years. That's what I would do. Okay. So that's my conversation that I'm having. Or if DCF is making a placement, don't even give me the money. Just do go to Superfund yourself. Don't you know? Don't don't take it out of me because they give us a hundred percent. So DCF makes a placement. It's a hundred thousand dollars. They're supposed to return the district a hundred thousand dollars after the first twelve thousand, the one time the amount. So we paid twelve thousand, and then dollar for dollar, they're supposed to reimburse that. But it goes there to the schools. Well. How about just having DCF operate as their own school system and let them make the placement okay, and then let them go and get the money there instead of from us? Because they're asking us to pay for it. And then they're going into the super fund and putting excess costs going into the town. Right. I don't need that. Is anybody following this? I mean, it's kind of like a Robin Hood, Robin Hood principle. No. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in a way. The, the, the key takeaway is the little basis. <laughs> Both grants are capped the way they exist today. And why so we talk about you know our EL numbers changing things, there really is no movement, no, no actual change in ECS funding form. So let's say things stay consistent for, for the next school year, where we currently have fifty outplacement students. Correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. How many of those outplacements will then come in house? But based on again, we, we've had this year that we you know we've gotten our program in place. To, to, to bring them back into the fold, so to speak. It's hard to say. I wouldn't okay. that right now. I mean, I'd be hopeful that we get one or two back, which yeah. would, you know, be $200,000. You would think that few, though? One or two? Not yeah. not 50%, it's, not 25 of them back? No? I mean, it's not. No. Because I'm just worried about which, so what's your budget, what's your budget line item right for, now for special ed? Fifteen sixty. We're up three hundred thousand in tuitions, and we're up another two hundred two hundred thousand in transportation. But so, but what number have you set for fifteen sixteen? As far as that 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 special ed bud, you know budget special line, budget budget line set teacher two, two tutors plus tra plus transportation. Oh. Tutors is about three point five million. Tuitions are about two point seven million, and transportation about three million. So, I'm not. So that's like 22 points. 20, you're currently at, how much? So 18 percent more over 14, 15 to what you have budgeted for 15, 16. No total budget, total South total budget for special, total budget is about 18 percent special. So, no, I understand that, but I'm, what I'm asking is that what what is what is your current budget? What is the budget that you set fourteen fifteen? Yeah. And what is the what is the proposed budget you've got for the fifteen increase. sixteen? What's the wait? What's the increase? In just the special ed right. portion. Right. I don't have that in front of me. It's got to be about. I'm going to guess about seven percent. Okay. Eight percent. Just for the board's clarity, if we have a program and a student is placed out, it's not a one for one and a guarantee that the parents would agree. To send that child back. So it's just, you know, but if we have a good program going and we place students that are here instead of out, we in time we'll bring more students back. Just so it's not a it's not a one for one. I mean just, just technical error. We can't just pull a kid back because we said so. I mean, right. And we're, what we're trying to do with the new program is model it to the programs that are the out placements. We visited them and those are programs that the parents are have been asking for the most recently so we're we're trying to model it after that so when a parent does ask for an outplacement we'll have everything that the outplacement has so it'll be a harder you know a, it'll be more difficult fight for the for the parent where we can go to a settlement agreement in that instance because we do have what they're asking for whereas now we you know the programs that the parents are asking for we don't have those types of programs in districts. So, you know, we're in a very difficult position. Typically, we have to say yes. Dave, I am. Did you want to comment? Or you, 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 you want to talk to us about yeah, the maybe. breakfast? Sure. Nothing I love more on a Saturday morning than you know, plowing out six inches of snow and going rub elbows with it. I'm Just sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't hear from my apologies. Yeah, uh, a lot of, uh, yeah, I was at the Matrix on Saturday for the state legislative breakfast. Um, as far as, uh, you know, who came, 
Uh, Senator McLaughlin was there, uh, Dan Carter, uh, Janice Keegler, and uh, the, uh, the newbie, Mr. Hardy, uh, all attended. Uh, Mr. Smith, Mr. Arconte, and Mr. Godfrey apparently had other things to do. Mm -hmm. So, it, it's difficult, and, and a, lot of people, a lot of the representatives who came as soon as we were done were running off to another thing they had to do. Um, you know, they went over a lot of the stuff that Joe just covered. Um, some of the things that I found most interesting, just to add a little color to, to what Joe was talking about, when, when the state talks about ECS funding, mm -hmm. uh, apparently the, for fiscal year 2014, the target ECS aid number was $2.67 billion. They capped it at just under two million, so six hundred and seventy-eight million dollars was never paid out, and, and they just stopped paying. And uh, part of the challenge, as Joe mentioned, and, and a lot of the representatives confirmed, is that they don't bother with the calculation anymore. Mm -hmm. So towns whose student populations are decreasing are getting the same, same amount of money. So they're having $5,000 more per pupil to spend, and they're shrinking. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know. Did they have a solution? I, you know, I, I spoke with uh, Mr. Carter, because um, he happens to be my mm -hmm. direct rep uh, as well. You know, it was, he was also on the education he, he, he was on the education. He's not this year. Mm -hmm. He said he just had that. Well, unless he signed back up, he was indicating that he wasn't on. Okay. Um, Mr. Harding is sitting on finance. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if that was punishment or you know, welcome to the party. Um, you know, Dan and I had a conversation that if the if the calculation is too difficult or too archaic, scrap it and start over. It's, it's too uh, instead of trying to go back and fix it. I've been told um, it's too difficult. That is the consensus, is that you're going to start tweaking numbers, and then towns that are getting a lot of money are going to get less money, and, you know, certain legislators will not get reelected. It's all political. Um, you know, to, to, you know, just the, the one thing that I discovered uh, that was new to me was the you know, big kudos to you know, our administration and to, to what Dan Barry's doing. Um, the state average spent per pupil is just under sixteen thousand. Mm -hmm. Danbury spends twelve and a half. We rank one hundred sixty out of one hundred sixty-four in spend per pupil. So we are incredibly fiscally sound as far as expenditures and what we get done compared to a lot of other places. Um, so you know, it, you know, we talked about the. Uh, the special ed funding and some of the excess cost stuff, the alliance grants. Um, uh, the, uh, there was some conversation on the 2015-2016 budget proposal uh, by the governor, what's being maintained and the recommended reductions, mm -hmm. the list of recommended reductions and a magnifying glass to read the stuff, because it, there's a lot of stuff on here. If anybody wants, I have a copy of the presentation. Mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, for 2015-16, the ECS funding is to be maintained at the current level, um, so there'll be no change there. Um, they're extending caps on certain statutory formula grants, it's not in public school transportation. Uh, they're cutting funding for extended school building hours on school components, priority school district grants. And then there's a whole litany of stuff that's either going to be that's proposed to either be eliminate funding or lower the priority for funding. It's just, it's, and all the reps admit it, it's just ugly. And hard for right now. Mm -hmm. for I'm sorry,
but we all need to be part of them because I'm going to by people that lobby professionally. This is how it's done. This is how it's done. Okay? All right, so does everybody understand how important it is? I mean, thanks, Joe. Just, Thanks for the explanation. Go ahead. Just two close. Rich, uh, increase your special ed next year, 1.3 million. That includes salaries and everything, um, all in uh, for special ed. 1.3 increase, which is about 10 percent. Uh, it will be the special ed budget alone. Be, it's a six percent increase. But again, that includes the teacher raises. You know, a lot of those are just contractual obligations that we normally have. Did everybody get a copy of Yeah, it was, overall it was pretty well attended, about 30 parents and teachers there. Um, and, uh, and I'm sorry, I, I again apologize. I, the snow and the pain and falling was a, a judgment call on my part. I lived the closest, so I just, you know. Well, slid not, down the hill. I'm sorry, it's not center. like it was the third fall. All right, and Richard uh, was afraid of snow, too. He's afraid of that. I think part of the All right, well, okay, stop. All right, next. Anybody else have anything to say about this? Thank you for coming. Joe, thank you. Any other questions for Joe? Can we move on then? Stop. Yeah. Go ahead. Note before uh, we talk about the district assessment pro uh, project, um, when Mr. Donovan did his presentation, he thanked many people. The person that was left out of that thank you was Dan Donovan, who's done a wonderful job yes. um, in leading this, this effort. Um, the uh, I'll, be, I'll be brief on this, uh, I'm trying to give you the mountain peaks. Our district assessment protocol uh, format that we use is diagnostic prescriptive, it's a medical model. We diagnose and then we come up with an instructional prescription based on the findings of our diagnosis. Um, we've been working, and when Kevin and Dodd made his presentation, um, we certainly are in agreement with much of what he said. Um, there's a well known educational researcher named Roland Barth, kind of a homey folksy guy, and he says you don't make, he asked Catlin, he's a beekeeper, but he's also a researcher. And he says, you don't make cows fatter by constantly weighing them. You have to feed them. And his point is, by testing and testing and testing, it takes away more and more time for teaching and teaching and teaching. There's a sweet spot that says, if we're going to diagnose enough to have an instructional prescription, we need to do some degree of assessment. It's just a matter of how much is the right amount. So our work has really been around looking at what we currently have on our assessment matrix, which is a calendar by grade level. We do kindergarten assessments, first grade, second grade, third grade, etc. Board members who have been here for a while have seen that many times. Um, and trying to find a way of consolidating assessment, taking more off the calendar, while at the same time not jeopardizing our ability to diagnose student needs. Much of what we have is driven by things that are out of our control. As fact, that we have no option but to take the, the mandated test. We're doing a practice test this year to test out the technology environment to get kids used to the, uh, the testing questions. As you heard Kevin mention, this is a very, very rigorous test. District after district after district has informed parents expect the overall test scores to plummet. We had a study team that went to Lake Plains on Monday and we were talking to their literacy director, and she said when our scores came out, because they were into the Common Core and, and that kind of assessment, so we just crashed. But it's a new baseline, and then from there you start to describe yourself back up. Um, we have benchmark assessments that we're required to do because we have teacher evaluation that um, is twofold. One is a growth model, helping us all get better as educators, but the other part of this is an accountability model. So we have to demonstrate to the state that we are meeting the letter of the law in terms of holding everybody under the rank of superintendent accountable to the teacher evaluation uh, plan that was submitted. And the pieces that talk about uh, benchmark assessments and 45% of high to student outcomes, non-negotiable, that's in legislation. So part of our system protocol then is based upon state law 
that we must do the following or to meet that letter of, of the law. Um, we use our assessment uh, protocols as well, the program evaluation. Um, years and years ago, um, there was what was known as blind teaching or blind leadership. We do it because we think it's a good thing to do. Is it working? We're really not sure. I think it's a good thing to do. It's kind of intuitive. Not good enough anymore. So when we do something, we couple it to a, a progress monitoring protocol, and that lets us know in real time, are we making a difference in the lives of children? Are our teachers becoming better practitioners? Are our administrators becoming better leaders? That process is really critical to us. It helps, it's our in-course guidance system. And so at the end, we look at our, our program and say, uh, we've evaluated what's working, what's not. Do we put more resources into it? Do we have enough resources, just means more time? Or are we actually getting no efficacy whatsoever, no real return on our investment? Is it time to jet, jettison this and move to a different uh, research-informed, assessment-informed approach? We use our, our assessments to inform our professional development. Uh, it's a growth model, as I mentioned. So there's nothing wrong with Bill Glass saying, I'm not as good as I can be. I need to look at myself in an effective manner. If I work on my craft today, I should be a better practitioner tomorrow. So in order to grow professionally, what do we have to do as a district to put real-time growth-promoting opportunities in front of our professional education staff and help all of us to grow and then measure the that degree of growth did really make a difference. We use it for our curriculum development efforts. Is our curriculum sensitive enough to what's being measured? Uh, you've heard us talk about coherence, and see, I'm sure you saw that in the handout. Uh, we're very big on the concept of coherence, curriculum, horizontal alignment. That little chart next to the single person, being gender correct. Um, with the blue circles, everything is aligned from the board's goals, superintendent's goals, cabinet's goals, <coughs> administrator's goals, teacher's goals, etc., etc., etc. Um, we never want to test a child on something they haven't been taught, and we never um, want to make sure we want to make sure that we that our curriculum is really aligned to what is being tested. So we write our curriculum, we teach our curriculum, we test our curriculum. That curriculum alignment process, as it's known, Alan Blackburn is the researcher that created that written top testing. That helps us with our assessment protocols to see if what we're writing and what we're teaching is actually sensitive to what's being tested. We also use it for our strategic planning. The board's coherence plan is grounded. You've seen it over and over, and over again in those three big wheels, student, expectations, staff expectations, district expectations. So we use it as part of our strategic planning, which we call our coherence plan. And lastly, although many of our assessments are mandated, there there is a need that we have to make sure that we know where kids are at a real in, in real time. What we're really struggling with right now, we brought Jonathan Costin from Education Connections to help facilitate this. Um, is what can we pull off our assessment calendar? What can we replace and maybe take one off and put one back on, but the one we put back on is shorter, more targeted, faster, maybe digital in nature, so we get real uh, we get assessment results again in real time. And the final thing with this is the governor, this is on his radar, um, which means it's on the commissioner's radar, or the commissioner to be, the state board of ed's radar, it's on our radar. We're not finding anybody that's in disagreement with trying to do less assessment and more instruction. The real challenge, the problem of practice, as we say, is knowing what to pull off. And if you have to put something back on, putting something back on that, that's leaner and cleaner than what we're pulling off. And so we have a, another full day retreat coming up in April uh, with Jonathan. Um, that is designed to help us get slimmer with our assessment, at the same time not giving up any of the rich data sources that we're um, receiving. That, in a nutshell, is going to be the elevated version of our assessment plan. Dr. Glass, I never, I never saw a schedule. That's because I'm relatively new to the. Sir, never saw me. Testing schedule. Yes. Yes. So is that? Uh, could you get me a copy of the What I can do, I'll be happy to email the board every member of the latest assessment. Sure. Right. And would that include like end of unit tests also? Um, 
the regular testing that a classroom teacher does? We have, we have uh, it's a great question. We have um, the regular assessment calendar that has the formal stop and do this, and then we have curriculum embedded assessments. In the end of the unit, it would be a curriculum embedded assessment. It would not show that because it might be an end of, as you said, an end of the unit. So I have a four week unit that I'm teaching, and I'll have a little assessment in there. What we're trying to do with our assessments is move into the idea of performance tasks. So as a student is actually doing the assessment, they're actually demonstrating their knowledge. And it, it's a way of deepening their knowledge. So we don't have a separate calendar for that because it would be, be massive because it's our curriculum itself. What we could do, though, is I could, um, we could put together um, an information briefing that would explain our end of unit assessments, those ongoing formative assessments that will show up on the assessment calendar. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, the typical benchmark assessment is given in conjunction with the teacher evaluation plan. Mm -hmm. There are three, one in the fall to, as, a, as an incoming screener, and one in mid-year to determine mid-year progress, and one at the end of the year to determine overall growth. We don't have benchmarks per se, for example, in reading um, at the elementary level. Um, when you look at our content areas on teacher evaluation protocols, that's where we would have those benchmarks. What's happened at the elementary level, since we've been incorporating in a cyclical manner the Common Core State Standards, this year it's really grades one and two in math. And so kindergarten, for the most part, kindergarten and third, fourth, and fifth grade teachers have taken the other coherence plan goal, argumentative writing, or prep for argumentative writing, as their area, uh, their, their student learning objective, and their indicators of academic growth and development. I'm listening to Mrs. Albertson. Don't speak edge babble to the board. It simply is, what do I want? My, where do I want my kids to grow? It's either in problem solving, one of the board's two big issues, or argumentative writing based on evidence, and how am I going to know that they're growing? So the, the way we've done it at the secondary level is we give an incoming screener, where are you now? A mid-year checkpoint and an end-of-the-year checkpoint. We've done historically at the elementary level reading has been a development reading assessment. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily benchmarked the same way because it's when you give it in September, it's where do I expect that young to be? Let's say they're at a level two. In January, where do I expect that young to be a level two because it's been raised, and at the end of the year, a level two. The weakness for the teacher evaluation plan is that we have to demonstrate that teachers are growing. This would look like a teacher flatline and make no growth whatsoever. Okay. Thank you. Well, just, just to end, it, the, if the point didn't wasn't made, we are really critically looking at the assessments. There's three areas that it's to serve. The state's having a requirement. That affects your $6.6 million. Okay, so we all understand that. And um, there are, there's, there's, the need for teachers to have information to help them uh, with the SRBI process. That has been a big issue in schools. And then if we do identify needs, what do the teachers have to implement <laughs> those strategies? That's the other. And the third thing I think Bill mentioned, but that's really a, a salient point. We are looking at, and the state waiver, and we're having conversations around what, what Kevin talked about. If moved away from a traditional uh, a legacy test. What would replace it? There are two states that receive Title I funding that were permitted to look at the embedded work, which is project-based kind of work, which is more relevant to teachers, less sit and wait, and but it's 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 just in time kind of work. If those states are successful, Connecticut may have the opportunity with enough advocacy. That's what Kevin's saying to maybe move down a line like that. So that's where we're going. The good news is one of the good things that's happening the, for the secondary, because the kids are tested so much as well, the new SAT um, been reformatted. That could meet and will meet, we'll know this spring, the uh, 11th grade test. So the kids would take the SATs and would not have to take the SAT. And then that would go to their, their college, uh, which really makes the motivation for them to take. 
so they're at least doing it at the secondary. We're focusing in on the work K-8 because of that. So we're working around the assessment. John Gincasso is doing the coherence plan, has been facilitating. We did get a grant to pay for his time from the state. Our goal is to give the teachers what they need, give the state what they need, and gain more instructional time for teachers. And it sounds simple, but I tell you, there's a lot of people <laughs> kind of uh, entrenched in some of this stuff. And we really got to have a, um, we got to create a, we got a tipping point for the learning. So keep, Just spend keep one more doing. point to what sounds that it will help really, I think it will help the board get a grassroots understanding. We frequently talk about a driver's education course, mm -hmm. and there are two assessments that they give. There's the book learning assessment, paper and pencil, you go and you take your test. And then there's the performance-based assessment. So when we talk about performance-based assessments, when they say, get behind the wheel and let's go for a drive. And if you ask yourself the question, would I rather have a driver that did well on the, in the test book, or would I rather have a driver that really knows how to drive a car? That's what we're talking about. Real time, giving kids a performance task, and let it, let's see how well you do this. That is much more meaningful to us. They're shorter, they're briefer, they're really instructional in nature. A teacher can coach in with kids, and it gets us away from stop everything you're doing, and let's go take a paper and pencil and online assessment. That's the big push that we're trying to make. Alrighty. Thank you very much, Bill. Anybody else have any questions for Dr. Lies before? All right, seeing none. Moving ahead to um, the draft. Am I going to that? Yeah. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the committee for coming out tonight, the other members that came out today. Uh, it was short notice. Um, Richard, I, I don't think you have this, and I don't think David has it. Tonight we just discussed the education specifications that we have to approve for the city to go forward with the plans for January High School addition. What we discussed. Okay, the uh, well the specifications were discussed at the high school um, with the principal, with the superintendent. They were all happy with it. Mr. Martini. Yeah. We'll get it to work on it. Um, yes, yeah, the 26 classroom, same as we talked about. The only key change in this is we define the auto shop in its location and, and what's happening with that. The Black Box Theater is also there as, as including music and call rooms. 26 classrooms, a roof replacement. Um, the committee's reviewed it, Dr. Sal, um, Mr. And Caccio. The study, and the study for ACE. And the study for ACE, which we'll talk about the council meeting on Monday. Um, so the way this works, you, you, it's just on the information for you. At the next meeting, um, it needs your approval in, in the minutes, and we'll need the minutes at, as soon as possible. Okay? And the city then will move forward. The commission's already approved for bonding, provided the board approves the specs to move forward. There's a referendum scheduled for June 2nd. This is second Tuesday in June. I think it's the 9th or something. Whatever it is. The, and, mm -hmm. um, if that if that happens, then 18 months after that, if it passes, we uh, we could be uh, you know uh, occupying a new building. That's that's the uh, in what year? Fall year of 2017. Fall of 2018. 2018. 2018. Okay. All right. So you want to take consensus? Or do you just want to no, no. It's on for information. Yeah. Okay. Well, at, at the next meeting, just so just if you have any questions, you know, yeah, they, give a call. They can't do anything unless you official. Right. Mm -hmm. All righty. Thanks. The rest is on for information. All righty. I would like to do my report, please. I want I have a, thing, a lot of thanks. I already spoke to you about writing the letters. I'll get you the information to whom they are, and Joe will give us, and Sal will give us brief things to say. Don't copy it. Just rewrite it in your own words. All right? Yeah, I charge you so you steal my stuff. <laughs> yeah, okay. Copyright. Yeah. Okay. Just give me five minutes. Always looking for a aren't you? <laughs> All right. And uh, that's that. Now I want to thank 
Um, my, my told Phyllis and now if you want to tell us before I thank everybody, how was your tour? <laughs> You're on those. Um, well, I only caught up with the second half of the tour, and the thing that struck me was um, how crowded our elementary schools are even after we did all the additions. Uh, it was shocking to me to see more street school, especially because that was very. But even the others, they're, they're all filled. <laughs> Efficient. <laughs> what did you say? Efficient. <laughs> um, no, but overall, we had a very good day. We started at um, Ace, which I had never actually been, I was only in the main first okay. floor, never the downstairs. And, um, and that was good to see and take a tour at that, especially with all the discussions that have been going on regarding that. Um, and then South Street, um, and they installed the new security cameras, which we already talked about earlier. Um, a Shelter Rock, North Street, West Hill Seven, and then uh, Park Avenue, which was good to see the um, new addition there, which is nice. So, good day. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. No, I just agree with uh, you know, Phyllis found this, uh, you know, right in the thick of it uh, at Shelter Rock. Just, um, you know, like we've been saying, we were actually done with, with all the schools. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, had, we knocked out five that day. And just the basic, um, you know, everybody's happy to see you, very, very, um, you know, appreciative, they have great tours, and uh, it's really good to see, I mentioned before how unique each school is, and, and different, and, and how they all do, you know, the best, you know, that they can, what they have to work with, and they're very, very different schools. The ACE we talked about earlier, um, I guess it was the first time I was there for, of course, the Thanksgiving, uh, you know, uh, just at that, that, that level there, we were, we were all around the great building, uh, needs a little attention, obviously, um, but we were all happy and met with uh, open arms and, and people were very, you know, let's say great actors, very excited to see us there. You know, I mean, just all in all happy, happy to, to see us there. Also, I just want to add one thing, um, uh, Janelle was going to do when he was here. Um, I was at Pembroke's uh, PTO meeting last night, and one of the big things they talked about was the invention convention. They had 68 participants mm -hmm. in the invention convention. Yes, sir. And um, they had seven going to the state. Uh, so that was a pretty, pretty big, big thing for them. And uh, did you, you do the Thursday? Or just, yeah, I did. The yeah, because I, I judged for the first time on the invention convention on Wednesday. It was about 180 kids. Mm -hmm. um, Eileen and I were actually partnered up, and we saw some. It was amazing the stuff that the uh, the kids put together. I mean. One of the kids up on this on Thursday yeah. from Thursday's group is um, going. Oh, nice. It was one of the winners. Yeah, no, that was, it was good. But all in all, good, good trips at the school. We'll uh, get together at one point with Dr. Stout and the last that we promised to like, kind of debrief our, our, our trips and. Uh, and maybe we'll take a tour of this place. We'll say that. Well, it's up and running there in a day. We'll take a tour of this place over here. It's never up and running. That's it. Okay, good. Anybody else have anything? Gladys, you will have a meeting next Wednesday. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just would like to thank everyone on the uh, committee last week for coming out. I think we had an excellent meeting. Uh, and our next scheduled meeting is April 8th at 6 o'clock. So please try to make it, and then when we get to the right of meeting, we'll have to ask the same questions over and over again. Thank you again. Okay. That is the meeting then. So. Sorry. All right. And anybody else have anything to say? Robert? Um, I no. talked uh, to Dr. Glass the other day, and I asked him just to give us a, an update on just where TDEC is right now because I think most of us feel that it's sort of been phased out or has been, but I thought the whole board should get it from the horses now, okay? Sure, and I just, um, I'm sorry. I, I just emailed all of you, um, unfortunately multiple times probably because I need multiple email addresses, do you all have the most current assessment matrix? And I just, sent um, the rest of the message to the instructional development team about the implementative assessments. So we'll get that to you very shortly. Um, uh, 
what Bob is talking about is when different regime, different commissioner, uh, different day and age, uh, we were required to create uh, a district enhancement plan. And to that end, we put together the district enhancement collaborative, TDAC. Well, people always say, what does the T stand for? Well, it's the district enhancement collaborative. That team uh, functions in two ways. Uh, initially, it was primarily created to do a strategic plan and to look at teacher evaluation slash professional development. When the State Department of Education turned around and said, uh, alliance districts which are now required to submit a plan, that plan superseded the old plan, and that new plan is our coherence plan. So that work has already been done. The second thing that the state did through a, a different piece of legislation was to uh, create the teacher evaluation requirement. And as the board knows, and board members served on that development team, we created a plan, it's submitted annually, it's reviewed annually by the board, uh, by the, by the uh, State Department of Education. This spring, we'll have to do our annual plan and submit that as well. So I think to Mr. Tabersack's point, TDAC in many ways, not all, but in many ways it's kind of a moot point now because there's no longer that driving requirement from the State Department of Education. Those needs are met via alternative uh, um, initiatives. The one piece of it is critical and why we do need to keep TDAC in one fashion or another is that an additional piece of legislation went into effect that said each Board of Education shall have a curriculum subcommittee of the board. Just as each Board of Education will have, each Board of Education must submit a teacher evaluation plan. So as TDAC serves as the board's subcommittee on um, curriculum, clearly, and we've heard this many times, and wisely so, that we don't want to sit here and look at every single curriculum document that you develop and go through it page by page and all that kind of stuff. We'd like the 5,000 foot view, as I just did, for example, where are we with assessment, where are we with curriculum? Our curriculum's all being aligned to SVAC. Um, but we do have, by legislation, a requirement that we do have to have a subcommittee. So in talking with Bob, kind of putting our heads together, it seems to make sense to us. Where we used to meet every month, and sometimes there were subcommittees, you heard Dan talking about the steering committee and offline committees meet every week. There's no need for that anymore with the district. It has to make collaborative because that's in the past. It's defunct now. But we would recommend to the board that TDEC, as your curriculum subcommittee, meet once in the fall to say what's our work for the, this year and once in the spring to say so what deliverables have been created that we can actually look at. It just seems to make a lot more sense. And it also frees up board members because you get this ridiculous high salary for serving on the board, um, so it frees you up from yet another responsibility. And at the same time, you can still keep your finger on the pulse of curriculum because we can give you all that information. Thank you, Bill. You're welcome. All right, thanks, Bill. Thanks, Bill. Um, do you have anything that education connection might help? No, your deeds, absolutely. Who's doing that? Education connection. Alrighty, but he's one of the people I want, also want to thank. Ralph and, and Richard and Richard were there on Monday night at City Hall for the forum on the edition. Alrighty, thank you guys for coming. And Sal was there, thank you, Sal, for coming. Also. Good job. Um, who else do we have? I think that's it, guys. What is it? Exactly. Oh, wait a minute, one other thing. Saturday. Saturday. We need to talk about the. Um, Parent University. How many people are coming? So we know. Okay. Oh my God! I know you're there. I know you're there. I know you. I know because I know you're there. Okay. And um, and Michael's coming with us. And just for some reason tonight we're off. All right. Are you coming? All right. It's it's good. It's fun. We'll all meet. All right. It's good and fun. And we'll listen to Sal talk. We're, we're talking about the high school edition. No, we're Gary. not. We're talking about the... Uh, Gary's going to be the, uh, the high school edition. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, you're talking That's about That's one that. of the strings. Right? Okay. okay. 
um, just and asked to, to see if we should get everybody, I mean, to come as we could. And going to places on Saturday morning were always fun. And there'd be no snow, so I would get to Blizzard. What did you say? Blizzard, maybe? Said, no, there's no snow. <laughs> Don't jinx it. It's all done. Sure. All right, it's all done. Ice cream stuff. You need a motion to go into accepting it. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I think nine says nine. Uh, we need a motion to go into an executive session. Do we need it? Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Okay, let's go.